Good morning. Thank you, Kathleen, for that beautiful introduction. And thank you, Festival of Faith, for inviting me to this beautiful event. I'd like to uh, introduce myself in uh, my native language, Anishinaabe Moen. Buju Nindinwe Maganatug, Melissa Nelson Indijani Kaz, Makunzi Gabawik Idash Nindigo, Ninpiju Dodame, Mikinak Wajiwing Nindunji Ba. Ni mino bimadaziwen, misaigo minik, miigwech. Jue na mishinam, jue manado, miigwech. Thank you. I introduce myself uh, as a member of the Anishinaabeg Nation, a uh, member of the Turtle Mountain Chippewa Tribe of North Dakota. So I carry my uh, native heritage through my mother's line. Uh, Ojibwe, Cree, and French. And I also carry my father's line, uh, Norwegian. And they both come from the Turtle Mountain area of North Dakota. And so uh, I've never been to Kentucky, but I feel like we're on kind of the southern end of um, the larger uh, Great Lakes Anishinaabe territory, which is a shared territory, of course, with many other uh, local tribes. I am a member of the Lynx clan and I am also um, a descendant of the Métis people, the French Indian people um, of Canada. And so I come to you as a mixed blood person, uh, honoring my indigenous heritage, but honoring all of my heritage, as we honor all faiths here at this special interfaith celebration. Uh, I also want to acknowledge the first peoples of this land, the Shawnee people, and the Cherokee people, and all of the spirits that have roamed this land and had their families here and sustained their lifeways here for thousands of years. And so I want to acknowledge the Shawnee people of this land, their spirits, their ancestral remains that are probably here under the ground we are on. And the Shawnee word actually is an Algonquian word that means southerner. And in our Ojibwe language, our word for south is Shawanag. So I feel somehow connected um, to this territory and this place uh, through those people. And of course, they are still here, even though they were relocated, removed, colonized. I'm sure there are many descendants of the first peoples here in this area, although many of them were relocated to Oklahoma. Um, during the very horrific uh, removal period in U.S. history. And so I want to acknowledge the traditional knowledge, the incredible original instructions of the first peoples of this land, and to also recognize, unfortunately, the suffering that they had to go through here and that many of the first peoples went through, and to seek uh, compassion and reconciliation um, for the First Peoples and their continued persistence and resilience to continue this day in the 21st century. So I want to take a moment to just reflect on the fact too that there are no federally recognized Indian tribes in this state, I found out, which is really quite unique. Um, it, just is a, it, it just shows the level of erasure uh, that happened here with the Native Peoples and to just acknowledge that for a moment and, and reflect that they are still here, perhaps uh, less seen, hidden, invisible, but still persisting. Thank you. And personally, um, I come from the north coast of Northern California. Due to relocation, um, my mom um, left her tribal reservation in North Dakota with a one-way ticket to Oakland in the early 1950s. So I was born and raised in Northern California and much of my indigenous uh, sensibility really comes from the first peoples of California. The Ohlone, the Yurok, the Hoopa, the Pomo, the Shumash, the Wailaki, um, the Maidu. 
And so I come here and I greet you um, from uh, the Redwoods and from Salmon Nation of Northern California, uh, where I've been very, very blessed to work with many of the tribes in that region. Um, who also are persisting despite great odds in one of the most populated places on the planet in California. Um, so thank you for coming here and thank you for welcoming me. Um, before I dive into a little bit more of the bulk of my uh, conversation with you and some images of our first foods, original instructions always honors our first foods, um, our sacred foods, our totem foods, as reminders of the connection between sacred earth and sacred self. Food is one of the key ways that we can acknowledge that relationship. But before I dive into that, I want you to join me in honoring um, what in my nation we call the seven directions. Um, many people of Buddhists talk about the 10 directions, others talk about four directions, others talk about 20 directions. Um, but for our tribe, we mainly emphasize the seven directions, the four cardinal directions, Father Sky above, Mother Earth below, and then the inner direction, um, the kind of mysterious, realm that we probably all just entered together in meditation. So if you don't mind standing up and joining me, and since I am really new here and arrived late last night, I'm trying to feel out east. <laughs> ah, the east. No, I've got a lot of different angles. I got a lot of different, uh... oh good, it does feel, okay. All right, great. So we'll do this in silence. I have some sacred tobacco here in this deerskin pouch. And if we were on the land, I would be placing a small bit of tobacco. But in here, I will symbolically um, offer this as a blessing to these directions, to request their blessings, and to orient us, to bring us all together in this space together. Oh, someone whipped out her app, Compass app. East is here, 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 all right. So pray in your own way, in your own language, um, however, but let's just take a moment to honor the East. South. West. <gasps> North. Father Sky. The heavens above, however you encompass this upper realm. Earth Mother. And the inner direction, what we call Gichi Manado, or the great mystery. The directionless direction, all directions, inner and outer. Thank you, thank you. So with this recognition, we place ourselves here together on this land, in this space and place. We recognize and honor all faiths, and all spirit and earth honoring traditions and practices. We recognize the great creator or creators, if that is your way, that has given us life. I'm very, very happy to be welcomed here with all of you and look forward to learning from you throughout the day and throughout the festival. As indigenous peoples and really all traditional peoples, we have these original instructions, the golden rules, 
um, the original covenants, the messages that were given to us by our creator or creators, by our gods and goddesses, by that which gives us life. For most people, these instructions include some of these fundamental following values. And these are not just empty words. These are true values that we need to embody and practice on a daily level. And I strive to do that. Uh, there's a little bit of an echo, if we can correct that. Thank you. So many indigenous peoples talk about these four R's. Um, it's not reading, writing, arithmetic. It's um, something much deeper and more uh, profound than that. Um, so the primary original instruction I think that we, many of us are given is to respect each other, to respect the land, and to respect ourselves. Uh, to honor and recognize the value and worth of all beings, regardless of how different they are from you. And this is a tough one to live, right? Many of our religious conflicts, many of the conflicts in the world are about um, difference and not being able to respect and honor differences. A key to that is the process of reciprocity. Uh, to extend oneself in partnership with the universe, to offer support and solidarity, and in turn to receive gifts and to receive support in a mutual effort of care and cooperation. So reciprocity is not just give and take in some economic transaction. It's an actual embodied extending of your energy and receiving a gift in return. And this is really a very, very fundamental and nuanced concept in a lot of indigenous life ways, especially in relationship to traditional foods. A key other aspect or value of this is reverence. To treat all life with a sense of beauty, power, meaning, sacredness. To honor and respect with gifts, gratitude, prayer, affection. This is also respecting what the Hawaiians sometimes call tapu or kapu, something that is so sacred it is actually forbidden from human use. It needs its own time, its own place to just be in communion with other beings. And that kind of um, respect for limits is another key traditional value. And that is restraint, something that our modern economic system doesn't know much about. Um, so restraint is to practice discipline in terms of self-inquiry, reflection, respect for limits, and being able to discern our wants from our needs. This discipline includes practices that are common in many faith traditions like fasting, solo time, vision quests, meditation, or even sacrifice, such as the Lakota Sundance and others where you fast and pray for many, many days on end, even stopping drinking water so that you have an understanding of the sacredness of water, that it is not something to be taken for granted. Um, related to this restraint and being able to um, understand limits is then an opportunity for renewal, to renew and revitalize ourselves. By practicing these, um, these restraints, we also recognize the great gifts that are given to us because we all constantly change. And with conscious change, when we can restore and renew ourselves, to nurture our spirits and our bodies and all the dimensions of our being, as the earth needs renewal also through rest, such as following a, a field um, in farming, and sometimes small-scale disturbance like digging or fire that many ecologists now talk about. And another key part of all of these very kind of weighty and, and profound values um, are humility and humor. Indigenous peoples always say one of our greatest survival tools has been humor. So it's really key to be able to make fun of ourselves, to laugh at ourselves, to not take ourselves too seriously, and to acknowledge when we make mistakes. Um, humility brings self-acceptance um, and to help us keep learning and keep laughing. Uh, in the face of a lot of tragedy, um, it's important to be able to use humor as a way to transform that energy into something productive. So I am interested in really practicing these instructions 
and I believe they will help transform our culture so that we can truly honor sacred earth and sacred self in a real and embodied way. I believe that embodying these instructions will lead to a peaceful revolution and the cultural transformation so needed to help create a resilient humanity and a resilient earth for future generations. This will ensure that these future generations will be able to enjoy the beauty and the sacredness of the earth and her bounty and all of our relations that she gives us. I don't want to see the current species loss crisis continue and place our own species, Homo sapiens, on that list. I don't want to see our future generations drown in the toxins of our machines that our species has made. We are teetering on what Gary Snyder has called post-industrial pre-collapse. And due to climate change that is occurring right now, it's not going to occur, it is occurring right now, we have some major, major obstacles ahead of us. And I think it's only through compassion and cooperation that we'll truly be able to transform ourselves and address these problems in a uh, beautiful and um, helpful solution way. So critical to this process of transformation is the concept of indigeneity. How many of you have heard this concept, indigeneity? Ah, just a few. So everyone knows about indigenous people that is tied to our ancestral lands, our heritage, our rights, our unique status with the United Nations, as nations, with sovereignty. But the concept of indigeneity is really important, has been used a lot by Native peoples themselves, as well as a larger extended community. And I want to quote now from the great Okanagan writer and activist Jeanette Armstrong. Some of you may be familiar with her work. If you're not, you should definitely look her up. She's an extraordinary uh, teacher. She has written that the concept of indigeneity can be reframed as a social paradigm and a much needed environmental ethic rather than a political or historical term. Advancing a concept of indigeneity as a social paradigm also provides a way to enter the dialogue about the paradigm shift required to arrest current trends that are destructive to the environment. What do you guys think of that? Does that make sense? It's a very radical uh, proposal, actually, from an indigenous woman to talk about indigeneity not as based on your DNA, your heritage, um, your biological or cultural background, but basically on a social paradigm that all people must adopt if we are to really embody an environmental ethic that can continue life on Earth. For me, this transformation or paradigm shift Jeanette talks about includes several key shifts. One is moving from this black-white polarity thinking to symbiosis and synergy and complementariness. Too often we see conflicts when we really can see partnerships. It's also going from fragmentation to wholeness. Again, looking at the parts rather than the whole. It also goes from scarcity to abundance, thinking that there's never enough to there's always enough if you share, if you support an ethic of generosity. From conflict to collaboration. Again, rather than trying to see things as colliding, as uh, Caroline Casey and others talk about, when things collide, there's that conflict. But if they dance, there's a spiral movement, and they can actually collaborate and cooperate and learn from each other. I want to see um, us move from an economy of desecration, where we're mining the land, destroying ecosystems, polluting our water, to an economy of consecration, we were, where we are making whole, making sacred, restoring, cleaning up, and bringing life and animating life back to our land bases. This transformation includes planting seeds of peace that the great Haudenosaunee nations just north of here talk about, taking shelter under the tree of peace that we all need to do today. We need to plant these seeds of peace within each other, within our beautiful earth, and of course within ourselves, which is sometimes the hardest place to do it. 
Please join me in offering a simple seed of peace to your neighbor. You can say, I offer you understanding, I offer you respect, I offer you peace, I offer you care. What word would that be for you? Please don't think too much about this and just look at your neighbor and what is a, a seed of peace that you would offer to your neighbor? Anyone want to share a few of those seeds? Joy. Joy. Gentleness. Gentleness. Nice. Listening. Gratitude. Listening. Gratitude. Mm-hmm. Understanding. Understanding. Okay. All of the above. <laughs> and more. <laughs> Wonderful. Thanks so much. I appreciate that. I believe that our society is hungry for the sacred, yet we are constantly nourished by it. We just don't often recognize it. Due to the complexities of modern life, our technological uh, overstimulation, we often uh, forget and, and don't pay attention to how much we are daily nourished by the sacredness of Mother Earth. We often find instead toxic mimics, and we forget how to access this basic human right and life right to honor the sacred in our daily life. So how are these two concepts connected, the earth and the self, through this conduit or this flow of sacredness? I should really be asking, how did these two get separated in the first place? That's the real question. As one of my late great teachers, the physicist philosopher David Bohm used to say, we make false unifications based on false divisions. The idea that the earth and the self are separate is actually a complete illusion on multiple levels, from quantum physics to ecology uh, to spirituality. The sacred elements not only become our bodies and beings, They are our bodies and beings, literally and metaphorically. Through air, wind, we have our breath, our spirit. Every moment we breathe in earth, we breathe in that spirit into our bodies, the most fundamental thing that gives us life. This is why meditation practices, I believe, focus so much on the breath to to remind us of that. The Maoris of Aotearoa, New Zealand, have a concept, teha, This is the breath of life that we all share. And many people see that when Pacific Islanders greet each other and and many um, peoples, Arctic peoples greet each other, they put their noses together. It's not to rub noses, it's actually to, to share breath, to get your breath, your inhalation and your exhalation very close to each other, to know that you are united, that you're not two people, you're actually one being connected to the greater breath of life. So teha is a very important concept for Maori and other Pacific Islanders, and closely related to aloha, which often is translated as love and has many, many different interpretations and meanings. It's a very complex, nuanced word, but it often also means the the breath, the joy of this breath of life that we share, so is often connected to affection and to love. The Mutz and Ohlone people of the San Francisco Bay Area, where I live, um, the Ohlone people who do not have federal recognition, were given an extinction sentence by the government, um, are very, very much uh, invisible in the local culture. They are still here and they're reclaiming their heritage and their land and their culture and their language. And they have a concept, no son, no son. In breath, so it is in spirit which again, constantly connects you and reminds you of that element that gives us our our sustenance. Through the earth, through the soil, we have our flesh, we have our blood, carbon, hydrogen, iron, nitrogen, I could go on and on on the periodic table. These earth elements, which are stardust, 
are in our physical beings. So sacred earth and sacred self are again united there through our tangible, most embodied physical flesh. Through water, uh, we have, yes, our blood flowing through us like rivers, and we have our emotions, all those fluid, dreamlike, intuitive, dynamic uh, feelings that we have are is like the subtlety of water. You can see through it sometimes, other times there's reflections. So our emotional world is often connected to the sacredness of the water world on planet Earth. And through fire, we have our spirits, uh, fiery spirits and passions and aspirations. Um, so again, sacred Earth, sacred self are tangibly, literally connected, not just metaphorically. And the most obvious way our Earth becomes us is through all of these things, the air that we breathe, the water that we drink, and the food that we eat. This is biochemical transformation, alchemy, and it means life regenerates as embodied spirit. So it breaks down, again, this artificial barrier between body and spirit, mind and matter. And as Gary Snyder says, who we'll all be able to hear tonight, um, the, the Solution to the um, mind matter conundrum is no matter, never mind. <laughs> now, these very same things, air, water, food, can unfortunately also cause illness and even death as our air, water, and soils have become polluted with horrible toxins that bioaccumulate in our systems and cause dis ease. These sacred elements now can harm us because we have harmed them. Because ultimately we are not separated. We are in a constant macro and microscopic sensuous interaction with the animate world that surrounds us, including our cities, our factories, and our dump sites. They too are a reflection of our humanity. So how do we restore and consecrate these elements and ecosystems once again? I've really dedicated my life to that work. So have many of you. I want to acknowledge and honor Kenny Ozabal, the founder of Bioneers. And the Bioneers movement has been very much focused on this for 25 years. Really, how do we restore and reconsecrate a sacred relationship with Mother Earth? And I'm thinking of really getting back to the basics. We need to really think of our fundamental needs, not our wants. And these basics are our food and our water. For the Navajo Nation, food is chi'iyan, chi'iyan. This means chi, connected to you know, other languages, is actually the intestines and is connected to the earth going down. Yan is connected to an upward movement. So fundamental to the concept of food in the Navajo language, chi'iyan, you have the earth below and the heavens above, or for them, father or a male gender above and a female gender below. And so chi'iyan, food, means the balancing and the integration of matter and spirit of heaven and earth above and below. So that core concept reframes the way we think about food. For the Hawaiians, land is called aina. It's often just translated to mean aina. You see phrases all the time, malama aina, aloha aina, take care of the land, love the land. But it's more than that. Aina is really um, that which nourishes us. If you look at the definition of land, it's that which nourishes us. So the emphasis, again, is on that reciprocity. The land nourishes us, so we must nourish it. Um, to remain uh, alive and, and continue a, a sensuous balance um, for all of life. I want to let you know that there is a thriving Native foods movement here in America, in Turtle Island, with Native American communities, intertribal communities, uh, urban indigenous communities, and it's burgeoning. It's a very, very exciting movement incorporating food and water, health, uh, nutrition, and healing. There's also a burgeoning international indigenous food sovereignty movement focused a lot around the sacredness of seeds, protecting the seeds from corporate uh, privatization or from genetic modification. 
and to maintain the traditional ecological knowledge and the original instructions of how to maintain a healthy relationship with our seeds, what we often call our first foods, our totem foods, our sacred foods. I want to show you a few images of these first foods um, and just tell you a little bit about the work I'm involved with through the Cultural Conservancy. And first up there, you see a beautiful strawberry. Who doesn't love strawberries? I know some people are a little allergic to them. Um, but if you look at it cut in half or if you look at it whole, what does it look like to you? Anything? <laughs> Interesting, okay, good. That wouldn't be the first anatomical part I think of, but good. Um, the heart. And in our Ojibwe language, um, the strawberry is odeamin, and heart is ode. So um, the strawberry for us is our heart berry. And if you have actually look at our word min, it's more than just berry, it's more like a gift. So a strawberry is a heart gift from the earth. And all native peoples of Turtle Island really have these beautiful first strawberry ceremonies. And you cannot eat a strawberry until you go through this ceremony to honor strawberry as the um, first spring fruit that gives you life. That's the, the earth giving you little hearts um, to, to nurture you, loaded with vitamin C after long winters. Uh, it has incredible nutritional value. It's so tasty and yummy. And it's really, um, for Native people, the first sign of the agricultural cycle, the food cycle after long winter. Next slide, please. So we are really blessed to work at an organic farm uh, in Marin County, the Indian Valley Organic Farm and Garden at the College of Marin at a community college where we're restoring indigenous food varieties, um, ethnobotany, um, heirloom seeds, and doing educational events and workshops around them. Next slide, please. <laughs> they told me to ask them. Oh, not quite. It's a little okay. Anyway, another first food, salmon. Salmon Nation from the Pacific Northwest. And if you've ever had the chance to eat salmon that has been caught fresh out of a river and plank smoked like the Yurok and Hoopa do, Oh my God, it's so delicious. And again, there's a first salmon ceremony um, that the Hoopa and the Yurok and all the North Coast people from starting Northern California all the way up to Alaska um, celebrate again in their own way uh, to honor that return of that anadromous fish that starts in the fresh water, grows to be a teenager, goes out to the wide open ocean, grows huge, has an incredible life, and then comes back to that exact same river um, to reproduce and to die. And so there are many, many um, first salmon ceremonies that are quite beautiful. And after they eat the salmon, those beautiful bones are often um, taken by young men down into the river. They swim in, jump in, and place them at the bottom or even bury them in the gravel so that those bones can regenerate the next generation of salmon. So we have these extraordinary first food ceremonies that really tie us to our sacred earth. Next slide. Uh, this is more of our modern food that we've incorporated since European settlement, um, turnip, lettuce, um, kale, peas, and um, there's, a, like I said, a resurgence of traditional Native American farming methods, but also incorporating organic farming, permaculture, other um, food producing, healthy food producing activities. Next slide. And of course, the sacred corns, beans, and squash, the three sisters of Native American agriculture, which are so fundamental to this area and really all the agricultural peoples um, of the Americas. And they're very complementary the way these three um, special native plants um, work together in synergy. Um, with the, the strong, tall corn, the beans wrapping around it, the nitrogen-fixing, um, water-protecting uh, squash at the bottom. Next slide, please. Ah, this is a little out of sequence for some reason, but these are sunflower cakes made nothing, with nothing but sunflower seeds and water. 
and they're delicious. You literally just roast up sunflowers, grind them up, and add water. And this was a staple food for a lot of the native peoples of North America, um, these beautiful, delicious sunflower cakes. Next slide. And there is the roasting of the sunflowers. Um, again, a native food, first food. Next slide. And just last week, we had a beautiful um, Iroquois white corn planting ceremony at our farm. This is a Tuscarora elder, Rose von Totter, um, and we did uh, three sister mounds, and you plant the corn first in the four directions. You wait a couple of weeks till the corn gets up, and then you plant the beans and the squash around it. And this was a group of youth and elders, uh, teachers uh, from the California Indian community, the intertribal San Francisco Bay Area community, and uh, organic farmers and students of College of Marin. It was, we had about 70, 80 people and planted hundreds of corn seeds. It was really wonderful. And again, renewing that connection to the earth very literally. Next slide. And this is the Iroquois white corn that we were so blessed and honored to uh, plant. This was last year's harvest um, from the Seneca Nation. And um, we just broke up the seed and planted it. And then we have a seed bank where we're preserving it um, for uh, other native farmers and other native peoples and um, linking up with the seed sovereignty movement. Next slide. And here's the incredible varieties of native corn. When you go to the store today, you get what? Two or three varieties, super sweet, um, probably genetically modified now and really lacking a lot of the vital nutrients that the original corn had. All these colorful corns, different varieties of corn um, for different um, food purposes, ceremonies, nutrition, diets. Uh, and it's such a, such a beautiful, um, beautiful being from the earth. Next slide. Anyone know what that is? Teosinte. Teosinte, the original ancestor of corn going back 6,000 years. And so it was native ingenuity, or as Dan Wildcat likes to say, indigenuity indigenous ingenuity or traditional ecological knowledge that transformed this little seed, the original ancestor um, grass seed of corn to that other slide that you saw. And without genetic modification or in the sense of you know, being a good farmer, um, but not the kind of manipulations that are happening now to corn. And so to really recognize and honor that that was a native science, it's not just haphazard um, people trying this and that, but careful observation, trial and error, all the things that you do in normal science, um, native peoples have done as well, especially with their food crops. So this is the original corn seed that we have access to thanks to some of our allies. Next slide. And living in California, the staple food there is acorns. And this is a beautiful um, collection of coastal live oak um, from the North Coast area that we gathered on Mount Tamalpais and that we planted and that we turned into acorn bread through a very long, laborious process of leaching out the tannins. But again, for the native peoples in the fall time, Acorn ceremonies, oh my gosh, every month in a different region because they get, they ripen obviously in Southern California earlier and then mid California, then Northern California. There's over 20 species of oak trees in California and half of them, 10 of them are considered um, nutritionally important or viable and yet they're all different. There's beautiful stories about the different shapes of the acorns. The creator made them differently, some of them fast, some of them slow. They all wear different hats. These have their hats removed and they're often considered a female. Um, these are female acorn spirits and so in the fall time we'll be having acorn gathering and leaching processing and acorn bread making uh, workshops. Next slide. Ah there's the one I wanted to show you. 
So the abundance of strawberries, and this is um, on a beautiful uh, spiral uh, platter uh, made by a Polynesian artist friend. And this is the Cultural Conservancy's logo, the double spiral. Again, as above, so below. Inner and outer, it has kind of all of the, the directions united. But I just love that image um, and the abundance of these heart berries, um, these heart gifts from the earth, the strawberries. So um, let's, I think that's it. Let's see if we have one more slide. Nope, back to the beginning. Um, so now I want to show you a little clip about water. That was my image about foods and the first foods. And now I want to talk a little bit about um, our project Guardians of the Waters. Uh, we're renewing uh, the canoe traditions of indigenous peoples starting in California where their canoe traditions were sadly lost and decimated and taken away from them. And we have helped to rebuild um, canoes that haven't been built in over 100 years, uh, the Tongva Redwood Plank Canoe. We've also done tule boats and dugout canoes. And I'm sure there were many canoes on this beautiful Ohio River traditionally and, and should be again. And in the restoration of these canoes are really sacred vessels that hold the original instructions and hold the seeds and hold the stories. And like a basket, they're, they're from the earth. They're beautiful vessels that are really symbolic of our treasure trove of traditional knowledge. And as part of that, we're also looking at how to literally clean up the waters. So we're doing water quality testing, looking at water restoration practices. And last summer, we held a youth program with indigenous youth in the San Francisco Bay Area to really deepen our understanding of sacred water and indigenous water consciousness from the poetic to the political. So I'd like to share that short clip with you now. If we can do the video. Can you see over me? Should I move? Yeah, OK, great. We are guardians of the waters. We are Kenyan, Tarahumara, Salvadoran, Apache, Yaqui. We are Chicanas, San Franciscan, truth seekers, decolonizers, feminists, the Indian Oceans, River waters. Chalchi with Likwe. We are ambiguous. Queer. Maji. Agua. What is our duty as young indigenous women? How did we get here? How can we take ownership of our experience? What are we leaving behind for future generations? What responsibility do we have to reconnect to ancient water spirits? I ask that you think about your grandmothers and their grandmothers and in all Mother Earth, for without them and without her, we would not be here. Can you match grandmother's song? My my What is ours? What do we share collectively? You're going to learn this now, and you're going to relate it to what you've known before, and you're going to relate it to how you can share it in the future. You know, we're standing up like as Indigenous women and reclaiming these traditions and these skills. We are out of balance, and our life really depends on treating water differently. We really need a paradigm shift. It's urgent and our life depends on it. Sisters, hear our prayers. 
culture was taken away from us. We were told not to speak our language. Our lands were taken away. Our most sacred spot, the center of our universe, and the Navy uses it to bomb for target practice for years. We are forced to live on the reservation without everything we needed, which was a healthy environment. And so Native people had to learn how to make a living out of that. And they did, because we're still here. I mean, I have two wee dreams. Has it ever been mm -hmm. no. before in your lifetime? No. Any drops? Painful drops. Yeah. You speak yeah. problems there. I, I used to remember. catch birds. I remember. Mm -hmm. I miss it. I know. This place that usually has water doesn't have not even a drop. And what does that mean to us? Every life form that lives on the land is entirely dependent on fresh water. And only 1% of the planet's water is fresh water. Reclaiming indigenous health, this indigenous perspective, native media, native arts and skills, and the watercraft tradition. Discovering our people's uses in the environment, how we took care of it. Not only are we transforming ourselves by learning these things, but by transforming ourselves, we're in turn transforming our communities because we're able to share that knowledge now. Coming from people that have had big traumas lets us see that connecting piece, heal together, and understand how do we relate to all of that's around us. Indigenous water consciousness is really identifying with water on a very visceral, personal level. You treat it as an ancestor rather than an element that you're supposed to conserve. You think of it as a mother that's giving you your life. To the oceans and the rivers and the ice, take this message of prayer and help heal. Thank you for watching and thank you for listening to me share um, my words and, and teachings about original instructions and especially the connection of food and water bringing us together tangibly with sacred earth and sacred self. It's really been an honor and a privilege to speak with you this morning and to start this very special gathering. Um, so really from my heart, Chi Miigwech, um, very deep heartfelt gratitude. And in closing, we'll also do a three minute um, silence in uh, meditation. So again, thank you for listening and um, sorry I was on Indian time and didn't leave enough time for a discussion or Q&A, uh, but I'll be around. So look forward to meeting and learning from all of you. Thank you. <laughs>